Welcome back everyone to 11.11 .11, more applications of Taylor series. In this video we're going to be tackling limits thanks to Taylor polynomials or Taylor series. Uh, we're also going to be tackling how do we evaluate uh, some series and figure out what they converge to and then finally we'll go over the Taylor inequality. So let's get to it. So this first problem here we want to take the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x cubed minus x cubed over x to the ninth. So the first thing we need to remember our Maclaurin expansion for sine x. So as you see it goes back and forth positive and negative and we only have the odd powers. So therefore sine of x cubed well just everywhere you see an x replace it with x cubed. So we're gonna have x cubed minus x to the ninth over 3 factorial plus x to the fifteenth over 5 factorial and then so on and so forth. So now let's go ahead and swap this out. So here's our limit, but instead of sine of x cubed, let's go ahead and put our Maclaurin expansion. And now you can see something nice is going to happen here, right? Because we have this minus x cubed. And that's going to cancel with one of our x cubes there. And then all of the other powers of x have at least a 9 in them, right? 9, 15, and they keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So now let's go ahead and divide by x to the ninth. So we have negative 1 6 plus x to the sixth over 120. And all of these ones over here would also have powers of x. Right, so as x goes to 0, well, this is going to be negative 1 sixth. So this is how we can use Taylor and Maclaurin series to go ahead and evaluate limits. Let's try one more here. Again, x is heading to 0. Looks like we need to know the Maclaurin expansion for the natural log of uh, x plus 1. The Maclaurin expansion makes a lot of sense, right? When x is going to 0, we're very interested at the function around 0. So that's why the Maclaurin expansion makes a lot of sense here. OK, so now let's go ahead and swap in our Maclaurin expansion here. And just as before, we can see that we're going to have x minus x. So those are going to cancel. That's very nice. And it looks like we have to distribute this negative sign. So let's go ahead and do that. So what's going to be left over? Well, we're going to have maybe an x squared over 2. But it's going to be positive. Then we're going to have negative x cubed over 3. And it's going to keep on going forever and ever and ever. The big thing here is that, well, everything has at least an x squared in it. Right, x squared, x cubed, the next one probably be x to the fourth. So all of them we can cancel, you know, an x squared out of. Then we're going to have one half minus x over three plus, and all of these terms over here are going to have x's in them. So now as x goes to zero, the only term that will survive is our one half. So there's our answer. Okay, let's move on and try to actually evaluate what series converge to. So use Taylor series to evaluate the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of 2 to the k over k factorial. And the idea is we have to take this and make it look like, or think about how does it look like, one of our Maclaurin expansions that we already know. So let's go back here to our list. And I'm going to go ahead and paste our uh, problem here. And I'm going to replace the k's with n's, just because all of these have n's. Our problem had k's. And now I have to go down this list, right, looking at all of these nice sums. And I have to figure out which one does ours look like, right? And so you can just go down the list. And you can kind of see this uh, e to the x is a good choice, right? So it has an n factorial in the denominator which is good. And you can imagine if you replace that x with a 2, we'd be done. So therefore, you would think, hey, this converges to e squared. And in fact, it does. So let's go ahead and go back to our problem and write down a little bit to show what kind of work we need. So since, and we're just going to go ahead and quote uh, the Maclaurin expansion for e to the x, so that's the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial is equal to e to the x. We know if we went ahead and replaced that, everywhere we see an x with a 2, 
Well, the sum would go to e squared. And so therefore, again, if we summed up from k equals 0 to infinity of 2 to the k over k factorial, this would also equal e squared, right? Because we're summing up all the different values. We're just using a different index variable. All right, there's our final answer. And let's do one more of these. A little more difficult, though, this time because we don't have kind of this general formula uh, for the series. So that's maybe our first step here. We need to figure out, okay, how can we express this in our sigma notation? So we're going to take this piece by piece. right? So we're going to sum up. I'm going to use n. I like n more. n from 0 to infinity. All right. And maybe the first thing we can see, there's a lot of odd numbers here. So I'm going to do 1 over. 2n plus 1, right? So when I plug in n equals 0, I'd get 1. When I plug in n equals 1, I'd get 3, then 5, and then 7. So that seems to be getting all of these odd numbers. OK, moving on, I can see that it's positive, negative, positive, negative, and then probably positive. So I'm going to do one of these negative ones uh, to the nth power. And of course, that gives me the alternating. And then we can see this 2 to the 1st, 2 to the 3rd, 2 to the 5th, 2 to the 7th. So that's going to be 2 to the 2n plus 1, but not quite, right, because it's in the denominator. So let me just do 1 half raised to the 2n plus 1. OK, now again, we kind of have to map this. We have to look at this and figure out, OK, which does this look like? If I had my list of Maclaurin series, so I'm going to copy this and go back up. To our list here and I'll paste it and I have to try to figure out which one does this look like so skimming the list the one that has a lot to do with odds is sine and inverse tangent but sine doesn't work right because it needs a factorial so inverse tangent is looking pretty good it seems to have all of the correct components and it looks like x should be 1 half. So I like tangent inverse of 1 half. So that's our strategy here. So I'm just going to hit back a few times. There we are. Back to our problem. So again, I want to justify. So I'm going to say since tangent inverse of x or arctangent of x is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the nth power times x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. We know that if we substitute x equals 1 half, we'll get our series. So tangent inverse of 1 half is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of our stuff. And that's all there is to it, right? So we found that it actually converges to tangent inverse of 1 half. It may not be a super elegant answer, uh, but that's what it is, tangent inverse of 1 half. OK, last type of problem here for us. We have Taylor's inequality, which says that if our nth plus first derivative of f at x is bounded by m, right, is less than or equal to m, for any x, right, that's less than distance d away from a, then the remainder, r sub n of x of the Taylor series, uh, satisfies this inequality. So the remainder must be less than or equal to m divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus a, the absolute value of this, raised to the nth plus first power. And this is for x within distance d of a. All right, so why don't we go ahead, and I know this is confusing, why don't we try to apply it? I'm going to consider approximating the function e to the 2x with the second degree Taylor polynomial. That's 1 plus 2x plus 2x squared. Find the maximum error by making this approximation on the interval from negative 2 to 2. Okay. So the big thing, or maybe one of the most confusing parts, is this m. Right. So m is some number 
that must be greater than or equal to the absolute value of the n plus first derivative of f evaluated at some x, right? So in this case, we need r sub 2, right? So let's go ahead and write this out. Um, so here's that m, the confusing m. Let me just write out some of this stuff here, copying and pasting. Uh, again, r a is going to be 0, right? Because that's our center of our interval from negative 2 to 2. And so in order to calculate this out, we need the nth plus first derivative. So that's going to be the third derivative. So let's go ahead and start calculating out some derivatives here. I have my e to the 2x. I need the first, the second, and the third derivative. So first derivative, that's going to be 2e to the 2x. Second derivative, that's going to be 4e to the 2x. And then finally, the third derivative is going to be 8e to the 2x. Remember, I need to choose an m that's greater than or equal to my 8e to the 2x for any x that's in this interval, right? So x minus a, this absolute value must be less than or equal to d. So what is a and what is d, right? So our center of this interval is at a. So in this case, it's 0. So we have a absolute value of x must be less than or equal to d. Well, this tells us that x must be less than or equal to d, but greater than or equal to negative d. So what do you think d is, right? It has to be 2. OK. So this is just another fancy way of saying that x must be between negative 2 and 2. OK, so what m value could I choose that I can guarantee that our function, our third derivative of our function, really, is less than or equal to that m on the entire interval? Well, we need to know where this function's the biggest on that interval. So this helps to know what e to the x looks like, or e to the 2x looks like. So if I was to graph e to the x, or e to the 2x times 8, uh, from negative 2 to 2, it looks something like this. So you can see the biggest that this function gets is on the right-hand side, where x is equal to 2. So whatever this value is, this is what our m should be. Because everywhere else on this interval from negative 2 to 2, our third derivative is smaller. So if I just plug in 2 for x, we get 8 times e to the fourth power. And that should be our value of m. Now we go ahead and just replace that m. So we're going to have the absolute value of our remainder is less than or equal to 8e to the fourth divided by 3 factorial times the absolute value of x raised to the third. And what's the biggest that the absolute value of x raised to the third can be on our interval? Well, the biggest that it can be is 2 raised to the third. So 2 raised to the third is going to be 8. And now we get a nice number, right? So we can simplify this down a little bit. We're going to get, let's see, I think it's going to be 32 thirds times e to the fourth. All right, and with that, we wrap up 11.11. .11. This last example is nice because it gives you an actual number, right? How much could you be off uh, by making this approximation? All right, and actually, that does it for all of chapter 11. So take a nice break, then do your homework, and I'll see you next time.